Thank you, Tatiana. Um, this morning, I'm going to continue to preach on mission. And this is uh, sermon number four. Like the last three ones that I preached was, you know, what's the mandate? What's the message we carry? I, I talked a little bit about that Jesus was sent to preach good news to the poor, that the poor are open to it and sometimes the rich are not. This morning, I want to talk about methodology, how to do mission work. For us this morning, it's going to be revision, and we're all going to be very peaceful and relaxed about it. It's familiar to us. But when it first happened, it wasn't familiar to us at all. It was actually very new, it, and it was confusing, and it was a bit controversial. And because of everything that was happening, we were in the Lutheran network at the time as well. I actually wrote this book to get my own thoughts about it clear and um, basically tell a little bit the history of what happened at Living Grace and, and just have a biblical basis for what we were actually doing. So, so if you want an expanded sermon on what I'm preaching this morning, the book is available as well. It doesn't cost much. Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I certainly don't make any money from it. <laughs> Uh, I prefer writing them than selling. Um, but when I wrote the book, it actually finished the debate, certainly in, in the denomination we, we were in at the time. Because when you look at the Bible, it's not controversial. It's actually very, very common. It's just we haven't been practicing it for a while. So methodology. How would you talk about Jesus Christ? How would you attract people to the good news of Jesus Christ? according to the Bible. And, and there's more than one. And in the church, they play one against the other, but it's actually a package deal. All of it counts. So give me one. Love them. Yeah, love, wonderful. So um, I back it up with a bit of Bible verses as well. This is very quick. Um, so Jesus, for instance, says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So, so basically, by the Spirit of God, there's love in the church and love to such an extent that anyone coming in and watching is amazed. Like, wow, a people that love one another. Man, they must belong to Jesus. So, are we there yet? Well, but we are a work in progress. And it is among us. So, God is building community among us. And then probably another one with love. Jesus saying, uh, this is Matthew chapter 5, You're the light of the world. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds. Good deeds out of holiness, out of love and then glorify your Father in heaven. So there's yeah, love, and it's supernatural. It's by the Spirit of God. It's very attractive. People want to belong to that. Um, definitely, it's giving witness to Jesus Christ because he's doing something that we in our own strength cannot do in terms of community. But then, apart from that, and it's not one against the other, what was the most common strategy that Jesus used to preach the good news. Sorry? Stories. Stories. Fellowship. Fellowship. Good, good. Encouragement. Yes. Well, he did a lot of things, but I would say um, he did it with healings and miracles. And i just give you a little bit, a few scriptures uh, about that. And, you know, we have it up here because it's so important to us. Um, Matthew chapter 4, and this is just Jesus starting out. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And Matthew, oh yeah, there are plenty of those. Mark chapter 2, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I want you to know that. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he was paralyzed, but he got up and he was healed. 
and it confirmed that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. In John chapter 6, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Um, John chapter 10, when there was a bit of conflict with people, Jesus told them, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. John chapter 20, this is the end of one of the books in the Bible telling the story of Jesus, and it's saying this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these miracles are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In Acts chapter 2, when the first sermon was preached to people in Jerusalem, Peter told them, said to them, Jesus was a man accredited to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So it wasn't under dispute. It happened. Everyone saw it. Um, okay, so that's Jesus. And then, you know, you can say Jesus did what he did, but we are not Jesus. But Jesus actually commissioned us to do the same. Um, for instance, I give you two scripture references, Matthew chapter 10. Proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy and drive out demons. So that's the job description. Preach the kingdom, heal the sick. I leave raising the dead to Tatiana. <laughs> <laughs> Mark 16, uh, Jesus says to the disciples after the resurrection, you go into all the world preaching, and these signs will follow your preaching. And then it says, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. And that was healings and miracles and, and so on and so on. Convinced? Or do you need more scriptures? I, I have dozens of them. Like, um, you know, some people, they say, yeah, but you only quoted from the Gospels and Acts, and they were just mad keen on signs, wonders, and miracles. But we, we love Paul. He's more intellectual. You are into those wild stories, but like, man, that's really not the heavy-duty Christianity that we love. We love the Apostle Paul. And then the Apostle Paul, you know how he how he summarized his entire ministry in all the congregations. This one is in 1 Corinthians 2, and he summarized his mission work among the Corinthians with these words, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he said, not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. So... That's the Apostle Paul. So you can be an intellectual and still have a place for miracles. Um, yeah, anyway. Why was it new for us? Yeah, like um, I've never seen a practice in any of the churches that I attended. That was never the way of doing mission work. And why not? Yeah, like, it, 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 we, we can't remember. So, when I grew up, what was the dominant worldview of the world at the time? It was human rationalism. You know, the power of human reason. It was materialism. Like, anything spiritual was weird, spooky, and superstitious, and no sane person would believe in it. So if you, church, want to be respectable and be heard in the modern culture, you do away with the miracles because we all know they're nonsense. They never happened. Does that sound familiar? That was the, old, that was the dominant worldview we were in at the time. And so Christians were a little bit embarrassed by the miracle stories and cut them out of the Bible. That's, that's what I've gone up with until I sort of 
realized, well, we can cut them out of the Bible, but not out of this world, because God is still doing them. Okay, so we are not quite at that place anymore. Um, let's go to the next one. There is a range of miracles. So not just one, but if you picked one, which one would you pick? Healings, miracles. Like, let's, let's have a, the range first. What sort of miracles do you remember in the Bible Jesus performing? Water into wine. Yeah, water into wine. Who said that? Here we go. It's telling something about you, Karen. <laughs> this is, could be your favorite miracle. Water into wine. Feeding the multiplying food, walking on water, raising Lazarus from the dead, healings, plenty of healings, stilling the storm, yes, salvation, yes, raising from the dead, and then you know these supernatural fishing expeditions. Like suddenly, you know, like miraculous catch. And I liked it, you know, he told Peter, you go fishing, you put the line in there, the, the fish you get, you look into the mouth, there's a gold coin in it. So, which one is your favorite? Cursing the tree. <laughs> That's not your favorite, Stephen. That's not your favorite. Well, if, if you're task orientated, you say healings are pretty good. Like if people are in pain, maybe that should be our favorite. But I think walking on water would be, could be cool. Or... No, raising the dead. Raising the dead. Oh. You go for that. Okay. So there's a range. That's Jesus' miracles that he performed. Do you remember others in the Old Testament even? Crazy ones? Manna. Manna? Did he say manna? Yeah. Angel food appearing in the desert. Sorry? Yeah, parting the water. I like where an axe head floats in water. Just because the prophet throws a, something into the water and then the axe head comes up. Yeah, striking a rock with water. What about the wooden staff? When you drop it, it turns into a snake, and if you pick it up again, it becomes. Oh, okay. The fire falling from heaven. Yeah, that's a wild one. Burning bush, so wonderful. So we have a great variety of miracles in the Bible. Um, now, the, uh, let me, where am I here? A range of miracles. Now, the question with the variety of miracles is God allowed to do a miracle today that has not a precedent in the Bible? That was a, that was a big question here at the time. Like, I remember a, a bishop was talking to me a bit like that as well and said, Gold sparkles, where's that in the Bible? All of the miracles were brand new at one point. <laughs> yes, all of the miracles were brand new at one point. And... and Jesus, I, I told, uh, read you the passage before. Jesus did many more miracles, and not all of them are contained in the book. So the Bible it actually only gives you a selection of the miracles that Jesus performed. And then God was always doing new ones as well, and sometimes it was just a one-off. Like the burning bush, for instance. Uh, no other bush burned and didn't get consumed. Just he, he can do one-offs, and he can be creative, and he can do new things. And there's nowhere in the Bible... A command that I can only repeat the ones that are written down. He, he can do whatever he wants. So, so the gold sparkles are okay. And then there, then there are miracles like um, there's a ministry, you know, lots of stuff is happening in them. In France, they hired a, a big expensive auditorium. And when the conference was finished, the offering didn't cover the expense. And then the minister said, count the money again. So they counted the money again, and when they counted it again, it was more than the last time. Then he said, count it again. It was more than the last time. They counted until they covered the cost. <laughs> <laughs> how, how good is that? And then the same ministry, um, apparently, 
in the glory realm of God, I don't know, there is sudden supernatural weight loss. So in that one meeting, there were about, uh, he said, 20 women. They lost about five dress sizes each. Like, <laughs> can you imagine the clothes afterwards? Like, So, yeah, some of those miracles we might not even complain about. So a great variety of miracles that are in the Bible, they still happen today. Um, especially when you're open to them again, you will discover that if you allow the Holy Spirit access to that, he will do them again. Now, the, um, so Jesus used miracles for ministry and he commissioned the disciples to do the same. Now the question is, do they work? Is it actually a good mission methodology? So Sarah is saying, yeah, not always, because people see and experience a miracle and then nothing changes. That's a risk. That's a risk. It does demonstrate it. Yes. How was it in Jesus' own ministry? Did the miracles work or not? Were they successful or not? Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, we're getting to that as well. You know, the, the, the great astonishment is that the majority of people that experienced the miracles did not respond with turning their hearts to God. Can I just say, I, in England, along when I lived in England, yes. um, I actually performed a miracle on my mama, and it didn't change her heart. So so your own mother had a miracle and it didn't change her heart? Yes, yeah, so I was in a church service and someone had, had their leg, a leg grow. Yeah, yeah. So I went home full of faith. She was babysitting. Yes. And she had a really bad back. Yes. It was very, a lot of back pain. And I said, Mama, let me look at your leg because it could be your, that your foot's not right. Yeah, yeah. An inch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, it was like, it yes. Was different in my so I prayed because I was just been to a service on school. Yeah, yeah. And I prayed that God would just heal her leg, bring yeah. her leg to the right side. Yes. Before my eyes, all her eyes, her leg grew. And she was like, to the right side. Yes. And she was like, oh, wow. Amazed at that. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So she knew that the healing happened, but didn't turn to Jesus. Yes. So that's what happened to Jesus. I, I, I read a, a few verses. Luke chapter 17. Jesus asked, were not all ten lepers cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? So one out of ten is not great. And then Matthew 11 then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon. They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And then we also know that the first sermon that Peter preached to the crowd in Jerusalem Soon after the resurrection, he said, Jesus was accredited to you by signs, wonders, and miracles, as you all know, but you killed him with the help of evil men. So sometimes the miracles, they cause such controversy and such apathy and such rejection that people are looking for a plan B in terms of mission work, like maybe there's another way. But... This is the way. Why are miracles rejected or why don't they make a difference? And you can test your own heart with that. Why don't they make a lasting difference so many times? 
You know, when we had the gold sparkles, when, when that came 2009, I thought this church would explode because everyone had it at the time. And, you know, even today, if we check it, people see it. Hundreds, thousands of people have seen the gold sparkles, but they're not coming back next Sunday to church or they're not turning to Jesus. They have, their lives are not being reformed. Why? People are skeptical. It, no, yeah. actually, yeah, they're skeptical, but it's undeniable because they don't, they, the miracle actually, it's not that they doubt the miracle. People actually have experienced the healing, people have seen the miraculous. They don't doubt that at all. And yet they... Yes, their hearts are hard. Control. So you, they don't want to give in? Yeah, to God, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like... Yeah, you have to have that God is God. But a lot of people, I think, um, they don't want to think about it. And, you know, you have gold sparkles. Yeah, it's fun. It's exciting. Actually, people get excited about it. Um, but that, the gold sparkles are not preaching. Look at me and then change your life. Like, if you want, you can just enjoy it. Like, oh, this is, this is, a, this is a wonderful church. Like, this is fun. And then you go out and there's no, nothing compelling you to change. Now, it's an invitation of God, a soft invitation, but it's not twisting your arm that you actually have to respond to it. And then uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> with the miracles, then you complain about it. I mean, for me, the mind boggles. So people see the miracle, they know it's God, and then they have issues with God about that. Like, instead of them changing their life, they think, God, you've got to do better than that. I remember when the gold sparkles first came, like, oh, I had one angry lady. It used to come from a Pentecostal church. Oh, she was angry because she wanted revival, and now we got this fluff. Fluff? What's that for? Like, that's not revival. Like, huh? I'm not doing it. Like, we, like, we didn't pray for it. If God does a miracle, we take what comes. I, I thought. You know, the people of Israel, they complained in the desert. Oh, manna. This, this light and insubstantial food and always the same. It melts in the sun. Like, God, what are you thinking? So it didn't really change their heart a great deal. And then, you know, we have other miracles like, Oh, falling down under the Spirit of God. Why would people do that? Like, and they're falling backwards. That's Satan. It, like, so we, we take issue with that. We take issue with that. And like, before, you, before you know it, instead of us repenting because God is doing something, we have all this entitlement and we think, oh, this is how it should happen. God, you know, keep an orderly church, please. Like... Um, yeah, with the, with the gold sparkles, you know, even with the, the bishop, like, none of them doubted that it happened. Like, they knew we were not putting something in the ceiling. Like, they, they knew it happened. Like, and they, they said, you know, oh, Edgar, you would be okay and we would welcome you and accept you in the church if it wasn't for the gold sparkles. And I think, I'm not doing it. But you pray for it. Yeah, okay, occasionally I do that. So, um, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it still boggles my mind that God can show his hand and say, I'm here. I do something that no man can do. And this is an invitation for you to actually listen to the preaching of Jesus Christ and what he's done, his, his death and resurrection and so this little miracle is going to help you to believe in the big miracle of the resurrection and your own resurrection to eternal life. And, you know, so God does it that way and we still find, I don't know, we're thinking, we're not thinking, we're rejecting it. And then there's another interesting thing with miracles. You know, there's a whole lot that they brush it off. And, and I still remember um, when you're doing it tough, 
And I remember one of the, the stories of missionaries, they were doing it super tough. And then God provided a miracle of multiplying food for their orphans. You know, so 300 people got miraculously fed by a little meal that was only feeding four. So, but she was still angry with God despite the miracle and remained angry because the miracle only provided food for one meal. But there was breakfast the next morning and lunch and, you know, life gets overwhelming and the miracle so recedes into the background. So some can brush it off and you get all these issues happening, but others do not brush it off. That's, it's the opposite. The miracle is, for them, the cause to rise up against it and exercise persecution. So, um, I've been reading the Bible all my life, but it, it, took me, it took me years and years and years until I actually discovered that according to the Bible, why did Jesus die? Even when I, you know, I was in Germany doing a PhD thesis, and my doctor father and all the learned people agreed that the reason why Jesus, in the end, ended up on the cross was because he cleansed the temple. This was Passover time, and... You know, it was heightened. You know, the Romans were worried about the Jews gathering and celebrating that festival. And Jesus took a whip and he cleansed the temple and he stirred up that fervor that God was doing something. And, and that was a bit too much. That nailed him to the, got him nailed to the cross. But that's not what the Bible says as the reason at all. What is the, why does... Um, yes, that got them angry, but that didn't push them over the line. Raising Lazarus um, is, is certainly one. And it's miracles in general. You know, like there's one instance. And like, if you think Jesus is always meek and mild, think again. So there were the opposition, all the religious scholars and leaders they were angry with him already because he was healing people on the Sabbath. So can you imagine? They're there, they're seething, and there's Jesus, and there's a man with a withered hand. And, so, and they're already angrily watching, like they dare him, you are not going to heal that man because it's the Sabbath. And then um, if I was Jesus and my wife was there next to me, she would say, Edgar, don't aggravate the situation. <laughs> Just like, maybe not now, no, not now. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to push it. Don't push it. And, and Jesus doesn't, he, he was not married. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only speaking the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, there's a lot of wisdom in Tatiana. So in these days I would go easy, but Jesus didn't. Like they were watching angrily, and then, you know, he said to the guy, stretch out your hand. As he stretched it out, it got healed. And then they wanted to kill him. Be because, um,. I've discovered that um, in, in you know, our previous network, I discovered it as well. Any preacher, any pastor could preach whatever they wanted. Like the wildest things, it could be unbiblical, it could be universalism, it could be just whatever. They can preach whatever they like as long as nothing happens. Right? Then you can talk, it's safe, nothing happens. But as soon as you preach, and then something happens. Like, you know, you preach, you preach the Bible, you preach on the Holy Spirit, and then you lay hands on people, and they fall down under the power of God, and then they get up speaking in tongues, and they got gold sparkles on their hands, and demons manifest, and stuff happens, and people go home transformed, praising Jesus, then you're in trouble. If, if nothing happens and there's no power, no one cares. But Jesus came with power and miracles 
a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And so if you're the one that has power, and it's usually the ones in government, the ones in government of the church, the leaders, it's their territory, and Jesus is encroaching, and the disciples are encroaching. And so with the miracles, everyone can see that something is happening and something of God, and then they were losing their followers. And it's crystal clear in the Bible. It's spelled out. Um, what are we accomplishing, they asked. And this is um, in John. Here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, Everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place, our position of power, and our nation. And so, for the sake of stopping and shutting down the miracles, they killed him. And they did the same later on with the disciples in the book of Acts. Do you remember how Peter and John, they healed the guy who was lame from birth at the gate of the temple? And all of Jerusalem knew about that. And then they said, look, we've got to stop this from spreading. And they put him in prison. They whipped him. They threatened them. And they said, look, we can't really listen to you. We've got to listen to God. And, and then before you know it, you find out in Acts that the power of God became so strong among the church and so wide known by everyone that would, people would come and all the sick would be lying you know, on, on the street, so that the shadow of Peter would fall on them. And they got healed. And you think, you know, if that happens, you would have revival and the nation would be yours. Wouldn't you think? Like, because you're not harming anyone, you're healing everyone. And like, everyone should just jump for joy. And, you know, all the disciples, they didn't want to run for government or anything. But they didn't jump for joy. It was too much power and persecution broke out. So, we had a prophecy of an outpouring of the Spirit coming to this church or through this church and not just this church. And, you know, that, that's a reminder of previous prophecies we've got. What do you think when, will happen when it comes? It will be unexpected. But I would say that the demonstrations of the Spirit's power will increase. Yes. Right? There's more of that happening. There are more healings. Break. We will have greater breakthrough when we pray for healings. And then how will we go as a church? What do we expect? Will we be called a cult? A cult, Ian. Well, because of what's happening. Ah, because of the weirdness of the miracles. Yeah, yeah, like... Sorry? Yes. So we will have greater breakthroughs of healings and miracles will happen. There will be people coming to faith and there will be lots of rejection. It will just be exactly like Jesus in the Bible. It, it, won't, it won't just be plain sailing. Even though people just get healed. And you, you can, you know, even the history of all the outpourings, of all the revivals, like, man, all the books written against them, it's just amazing. But this morning, I, I want to finish with um, one story from, in our own midst where I think it just shows how beautiful it is, what God is doing, and we want more of it. So this is... I got, her, um, I got permission to tell the story. It's Shelley's story, coming to church. And she came to Living Grace six years ago, 2017. In February, they, she came. And in her own word, words, she said, At first, I thought this is ridiculous. People falling down, the Holy Spirit, and a God that loves me, no way. So she only came because Joe, she here today, so her friend knew her from outside of church, and Joe just kept inviting Shelley, come to church, come to church. And, you know, she was, um, 
She just didn't stop. She just nagged her to church until finally, after a few months, what have I got to lose? And she turned up here and she thought it was ridiculous, the whole show. Um, Shelley's background story, like I don't get into any details, but just say she was extremely broken, she was in deep depression, so many things happened in her life, so many woundings, so many sad things, like if you knew it all, you would cry. So she came into that state, never been to church before, so Living Grace was the first church she ever came to. Um, I think, you know, she was here then for me, a long time, say, I hate God. <laughs> like, you hate God, so why are you here? So, um, um, right early on, um, she came, I think someone invited her forward and Helen prayed for her in the prayer line after church and prayed for her for joy. And the next day she was actually filled with supernatural joy. And the supernatural joy so it got rid of all the depression and like completely new life, which lasted about for at least two days, just filled with joy. And then the depression and everything else sort of came back. And so, well, I wondered a little bit, why, why God just two days? Why not fix it permanently? But probably my theory of that one is that God gave a glimpse of what can be, like a glimpse of what it could look like to live in a healed state, and then, but the healing needed to happen and, and, and it was slower. Um, I remember that did I say 2017 you came? Um, there was a meeting with Roland Baker around that early stage as well, and he, he came just one Thursday night, I think, and we had, you know, he's a Pentecostal, and he ministers in power, and one of the things that happened with him is people get supernatural laughter by the Holy Spirit of God, get filled with joy, and we had a wild night here at church. We had just bodies everywhere. They were all laughing crazily. I remember over there was Marcus and Sharon were sitting there, and they were laughing their heads off. I mean, Sharon, we know she gets the giggles more frequently, but Marcus as well, and all the kids around them just taking, you know, putting it on video. And, and so this crazy stuff was going on with everyone laughing and all over the place, and Shelley was sitting there, and I got a bit concerned. I thought, oh, she's New Year Church, and this is a bit of a crazy night. And so um, I was sitting next to her and asked, you know, Shelley, how are you taking all of this? And she said, I want that. <coughs> so she wasn't freaked out by it at all, but she thought, wow, she would like to have some of that joy. But it didn't happen on that night. Um, and Shelley says, there are no simple steps, no one, two, three, and then you're all better. It, it's just a process, a gradual process. And part of the gradual process was that Joe took Shelley to Helen. And, you know, they visited Helen at her home during the week um, because Shelley had questions about God and things. And, um, and then Helen made, gave the invitation that whenever she had questions, she could come over and talk. And so Shelley took her up on that and was over there more and more often. And then she was sleeping over and she was sleeping over most of the week, just went home for maybe two days or something like that. Now she's not going to home anymore at all. It's actually Helen that lives with Shelley. And Helen basically became mum. <coughs> Helen became mum. And so... And then, you know, with all that love and safety and teaching and praying, so it was a journey and that certainly helped. And then a breakthrough came um, at a renewal conference in October. That's probably eight months into being here, something like that. And so we had a, we had a weekend conference at St. Ursula's Gymnasium here in Toowoomba. We set that up. And Roland Baker was one of the guest speakers. And it was on the Saturday night, and um, basically, Shelley thought, 
That's all fake. It's all nonsense. I'm not going to come back here. And then she's sitting in her chair uh, while the preaching, while the session is going on um, in the evening. And then suddenly she's looking at her hand and something sparkles there and she could not rub off the sparkles. And so she's sitting next to Elka. Is, yeah, Elka is here. So, and she says, Elka, something's wrong with my eyes. And it's just like, you know, something is on my hands. And Elka just looks a little bit over her hand. Nah, it's fine. Like, so, so, but, but Shelley's mesmerized, obsessed with her hands and just looking at it and just like, what's there? Like, it's glittering. I can't get it off. And so you never listen to any of the preaching. So the miracle is confirming the word, not that night. Because um, <laughs> Shelley just looked at the sparkles. And then afterwards, she shows her hand again to Elka and Elka's, and her mum was there as well, Elka's mum, and says, oh, no, Shelley, you got gold sparkles here. And like, oh, yeah, gold sparkles. But apparently Elka's uh, technical advice wasn't good enough. Helen had to confirm it, so <laughs> over to Helen, so what's there? And she said, yep, that's gold sparkles. And then I asked her at the time, I asked, you know, Shelley, what do the gold sparkles mean to you? And then she says, it means that God loves me. And that was a big one. Does God love me? That's the huge question. And so like God doing that miracle, just loving on her, that's how she took it. I mean, God doesn't have to do it to love us, but it did it for her. That's what it meant for her. That was on the Saturday night. On the Sunday night, there was a meltdown. Shelley's word. So basically... Um, crying, breaking down, just a meltdown. Um, female meltdown. <laughs> ah, like, but, but it describes it. Like, so it, it just totally emotionally gone. So, and according to... Um, Helen's theory, it was just this whole idea that God loves her was just too much. Like, that was just such a paradigm shift and earth shattering. And so there she is again at the conference, and she's crying and tearful and leaving the session. But she's so all over the place, she can't find her car. So she can't go home because she can't find her car. And then there is... Um, Sharon is outside, bumping into her, and says, Sharon asks her, where are you going? She says, I don't know. And then Sharon, at that time, think she happened to have a bunch of sunflowers in her hand, and she gave the sunflowers to Shelley. And Shelley's favorite flowers in the world are sunflowers. So there she was, with suddenly, you know, sunflowers in her hand, and then she went into the session again with Sharon. And then, so she went there. And then on the way home, uh, Shelley says she had a God moment. So, um, I, I just quote her. That's probably the best. When I find it. For for the very first time, I believed that I had an experience with God, the gold dust, the sunflowers, and a moment. For the first time, instead of hating God and being angry and confused with Him, completely broken down, I just knew and could feel for the first time that, yes, my heart is really hurting right now, but I know I have a God whose heart is breaking with me and for me. What I felt in that moment, I can't describe but I knew and felt that God was right there with me. How good is that? So I finished the testimony here. It continues, and she's on staff here now. But I, I think uh, Shelley's testimony shows how everything works together. There is a loving community. There's a loving community where we are mum and dad and brothers and sisters to one another. And it's really deep and intimate. 
and we're doing life with one another and can trust one another, and that is healing and that is of God and that is necessary for all of us. And then at the same time, there is by the Spirit of God, there is breakthrough. And it may be a gold sparkle, it may be supernatural joy, it, I, I don't care what happens to you, but something that you know is a God moment, that you encounter God. It has to be more than just words. It has to be an encounter with the living God. And that's, you know, in terms of mission methodology, really, that's right at the core of this church. No one is going to be talked into faith in Jesus Christ. No one is argued into it. It got to be an encounter with the living God. And so we're declaring again this morning, we're repeating what we already know, and Jesus, this is what we want in this church, that you confirm your word, the preaching of Jesus Christ, with signs, wonders, and miracles, with demonstration of the Spirit's power. So it's not resting on our cleverness or because we structure things so well, because we have such amazing greeters at the door. None of that. It's an encounter with the living God in the church. And um, in the Bible, this is the prayer of the disciples in Acts 4. They were a bit under the weather with resistance, but they prayed, Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And Lord Jesus Christ, this is what we pray here in this church. Lord, I pray that everyone here will have an encounter with you and if they've already had an encounter with you, we keep having them, Lord. You keep showing yourself in your life. You said that we live, the kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And Lord, this is what we need. We don't want what the world has. We want, don't want to live in darkness. We don't want to be full of anxiety and fear and hate. Lord, we want to be covered and surrounded by your love full of hope and full of peace and full of joy and full of confidence about the future because you've overcome death. Sin, death, and the devil all overcome in your name. Lord, we pray um, for everyone here that doesn't know you yet. And Lord, we pray for our relatives, our friends that do not know you yet, our community. Lord, I pray that they will have a breakthrough moment where they see something, where they know it's from you. Lord, that they experience a healing, a miracle, it's not even difficult. But they encounter you, and then, Lord Jesus, I pray, you give the grace of a heart that turns towards you. Lord, I want to pray for everyone here this morning that's maybe grown up with knowing that you're real and people that have seen things themselves, maybe have experienced a healing themselves, Lord, I pray that this morning it's the end of ignoring it. It's the beginning of taking it seriously. Understanding it as an invitation from you to put that trust and the heart into you. Lord, I pray, increase the power of this church. Lord, I pray in your name that you pour out your spirit on us. Lord, we're asking afresh we ask that any blockages, any hindrances you take away. Lord, we are in full agreement that we invite you in, that you have your way among us, that you fill us with power, that we have the joy of seeing people healed and then seeing people come to faith. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us strength. Lord, you rose from the dead. You're the king of an ever-expanding kingdom. And Lord, we pray that it's going to expand among us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So with preaching that message, we've got to practice it, okay? Right? So this morning, I really invite everyone, if you need healing anywhere in your body, come forward. There's prayer line, people available. We want to lay hands on everyone, pray for healing. It's a bit open-ended, so I bless you now, but come forward and enjoy morning tea and fellowship.
Have a most wonderful Sunday. The Lord bless you and keep you.